A year ago at this time, the Seattle Philharmonic and I were preparing for the United States premiere of the Symphony No. 2 by Ruth Gipps. And uh, here we are a year later, preparing for the U.S. premiere of another superb symphony by a composer who never should have been forgotten, uh, Helvi Leiviska from Finland. And we're going to present the U.S. premiere of her Symphony No. 2. A uh, bit of background, um, I think I've mentioned on these podcasts before that I spend a lot of my time ferreting out literature that's unknown to me, always hoping to find something that um, I will be fond enough of to want to conduct. And so it was the case with Helvi Leviska, uh, the only orchestral work um, that I think you can hear of hers at all is a commercial recording that was made of her third symphony. And I came across this on YouTube, uh, was quite struck by it, and so I located her publisher, went to their website, saw that they had several of her other offerings uh, available for sale, and on spec uh, ordered a copy of her second symphony. Uh, when it arrived, I tore it open. Uh, it, it's a photocopy of her original manuscript, and it was one of those wonderful cases where I saw it and I knew, I knew that it was a marriage made in heaven, and uh, and so I thought, well, okay, let's, uh, let's find out about performing it. When I went back to her publisher's website, I was very surprised to see that unlike several other of her pieces, the only thing you could get was the score. Now, I don't know the story behind this. I don't know why there were no parts available, but the only thing available was this photocopy of her manuscript. Um, so uh, I started making a brand new edition of this symphony, working from her manuscript. I went to my music copying program on my computer and spent a little over a year totally re-engraving this piece of hers. And, and on a music copying program, once you're done with the score, uh, you can extract the parts from it. Um, so this is going to be not only the U.S. premiere, but uh, there is going to be a set of parts available for anybody who wants to perform this piece. Now, as Anderson Cooper would say, keeping him honest, I did write to her publisher and I said, this is what I've done. I have taken this piece which you represent and I've made a new edition. Um, I, I'm happy to give you all the files. I don't want any money for it. I just want this thing played. And they never got back in touch with me. So I'm taking that as a sign of tacit approval. So if I do end up being imprisoned for copyright violation, at least it's for a good cause. Uh, what is the piece like? Well. She was Finnish. Uh, she lived until well into the 20th century. Uh, and so the natural conclusion would be that it has some kinship with the music of Sibelius. Uh, that kinship is not as strong as you'd think. There's the occasional orchestral texture, which is reminiscent of his symphonic writing. Certainly that kind of Nordic darkness is there. Um, but she was very much her own person. There, there is a personality in this music that is like no other that I've ever encountered. Um, some of her material is uh, very much based on chordal relationships. In other words, the melodies are inextricably linked to uh, the harmonies underneath them. For example, the way that the symphony starts. There are other moments where it's a melody uh, very much in the forefront, accompanied by uh, a harmony underneath. And then there are even some places where a melody is belted out in unison octaves without any harmony underneath, like this very passionate outburst in the first movement.
As to the overall emotional tone of the symphony, um, I tend to think of it in terms of Mahler, in terms of Tchaikovsky. Uh, certainly there is a dark cloud hovering over it, which doesn't mean that it's anything less than striking and very, very, very beautiful. Um, I would say that it is a piece that acknowledges, if you want to call it that, the ever-presence of fate eventually comes to an uneasy reconciliation with that. There is a scherzo middle movement that is kind of like that wild Mr. Toad ride that Mahler puts you through in the scherzo of his Seventh Symphony. Do come and listen to this piece. It is a vital, important symphony that absolutely deserves a huge audience. The concerto on this concert is going to be the first piano concerto by Franz Liszt, uh, beautifully played by our most recent Don Bichelle competition winner, Heshin Chow. Back in 1980, I was an actor in a film about an international piano competition. Uh, the film was called The Competition. It starred Richard Dreyfuss, Amy Irving, and Lee Remick. And Due to one fluke after another, I was tapped on the shoulder to portray one of the contestants in this piano competition. My character was the prototypical, digitally perfect, emotionally sterile musician, of which there are far too many uh, examples uh, to this day. Uh, Pauline Kael, in her New Yorker review, absolutely nailed it when she referred to my character as, quote, a robotic prune with a small mustache and no personality. And that was a compliment. That's exactly what he was. And, um, and the piece that I played in that film, I, I wasn't actually playing, I was miming, was the Liszt first piano concerto, which I've never conducted before now. So it's, it's nice to come back to this piece uh, as a conductor after having faked it in a major Hollywood movie. Our concert is going to conclude with the mighty Symphony No. 7 by Beethoven. And as is always the case uh, when, when you explore and re-explore a work as rich as a Beethoven symphony, you, you find things. You either rediscover them or you find them anew. The two things that, that leapt out at me structurally, because Beethoven, as you know, loved to take the merest little bits and ideas and explode them over the course of a three or four movement work, uh, is the idea of contrary motion. Uh, particularly in the symphony, scales, scale-like passages moving in different directions. Uh, we actually get a foretaste of that in the introduction to the first movement, um, where um, while the violins are doing this broad main theme, etc., etc. Uh, you have around that a series of ascending scales in some of the other strings. Etc. And yet every downbeat for several bars is one degree further down in a quasi-chromatic scale. So you get... <laughs> spread over several bars. It's the tortoise and the hare. So you have this slow descending idea on the one hand and these scales pulling you in the other direction in, uh, on the other hand. Um, and this comes back in virtually every movement in some way. Uh, uh, scales running down, sometimes at the same moment that scales are running up. Uh, it goes particularly wild in the finale. Uh, the other uh, idea that keeps coming back several times in the symphony is this idea of half steps, uh, sort of obsessively uh, um, permeating the fabric uh, usually in the uh, lower reaches of the orchestra. Uh, for example, uh, in the coda of the first movement, you have the low strings. So that idea of, of that uh, uh, obsessively uh, uh, nagging ascending half step, dee 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 dee, um, and you've got that uh, famous uh, low horn passage in the scherzo. You know, 
And uh, finally, in the finale, with a wonderful vengeance, uh, you have the low strings. So that's a man who can take the merest whiff of an idea and do miraculous things with it. The other thing I wanted to talk about very briefly is tempo. Uh, there is still a bit of controversy about Beethoven's metronome marks, whether they should be followed absolutely to the letter, which frankly makes certain things on the verge of unplayable, if not unplayable. Um, but I think that the one thing that we all agree on is that they can be used as a guide to establish the relative tempos between movements and sections. Um, and the one thing that you frequently hear in the scherzo, uh, which is not very pianistic, but the scherzo is... That one. So the tempo is one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and he marks that section uh, 132. Now what you frequently hear when we go to the trio is something that's exactly half as fast. So, now if he'd wanted it exactly half as fast, he would have probably written something like doppio meno mosso, you know, half as fast. But in fact, he says assai meno presto. He wants it less fast, but he does not want it exactly half speed. He wants it somewhere in between. Um, for those of you who are uh, more mathematically proficient than I, which is to say everybody watching, um, you can probably do the math faster than, than I could when I had to go to my uh, calculator app. But the opening of the movement is marked 132, and the trio is marked 84, which I found out is 63 point something percent of 132. So he does not want the two tempos to relate. He wants... So he wants that disparity. He wants the trio section to be something other than fitting neatly into a... And that's Beethoven, the master of shock, whose works continue to surprise us wonderfully to this very day.